uh, let's go ahead and begin. Um, let's uh, let's start around the room if we can. Just let everybody know who's here. Jordan, you want to you want to start off? Jordan Chandler, Wasatch Front Regional Council. Mike Sopchuk, uh, WFRC. Kevin Crum, our Air Quality Board. Joe Smoke, Immigration Canyon. Mike Quickers, Cottonwood Heights, Mayor. Beth Holbrook, Utah Transit Authority. Tammy Tran, Keysville City. Andrea Pearson, WFRC. I'm Mark Shepard, uh, Clearfield City Mayor. Wayne Benyon, WFRC. Ted Knowlton, WFRC. Bert Granberg, WFRC. Anne Granado, Salt Lake County Council. Dan Dugan, Salt Lake City Council. Ben Withrich, Wasatch Front Staff. Hugh Van Wagen and Wasatch Front Staff. Will Gerard, Lake Point City. Lauren Victor, WFRC Staff. Jerison Atkin, WFRC Intern. And online, I'm just going to have Andrea read uh, read who's online. Okay, so um, the members and alternates for Transcom that are online today are uh, Mayor Rob Dolly, Jennifer Elskin, um, Mayor Marcus Stevenson, um, Council no Commissioner Jared Hamner, Council Member, and that's everyone else. Well, thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, yes, and also council member, um, I hope I say it right, Gerard, Gerard. Very good. Hey, so we have uh, minutes on the agenda from our June 15th meeting. And uh, I'm ask uh, Kevin to make the motion since uh, he had a correction to them. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, we had a failed motion last meeting, but even if it fails, we should have it in the minutes. So on a, um, item 4B, I think we should make an amendment to add the motion, uh, who made it, who seconded it, and the result. So. Okay, so we have a motion to approve the minutes with that addition of the uh, the failed motion. We have a second? A second from uh, Councilmember Granado. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, the minutes stand. That'll bring us to our chair's report. And by the way, we're, we're excusing Andrew. He will be here shortly. He uh, had a meeting up at the Capitol, so he'll, uh, he said he texted me and told me he'll be a few minutes late. So we, uh, in our chair's report, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to uh, Ted Knowlton uh, to give us kind of an update on uh, Wasatch uh, Choice Vision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm gonna just spend five minutes to talk about um, the refresh of our shared Wasatch Choice vision. Uh, you know that um, the confidence that residents in Utah have about the future of Utah is, is at a recent low. Uh, but when we ask, when in surveys, residents are asked um, about planning, if they feel like there's this there is a plan in place, then their confidence in the future goes up. Well, as it turns out, we all know this, I think, that uh, in the face of growth, we do have a shared plan. Um, we've just gotten to the end of a four-year uh, planning cycle collaboratively, culminating just um, in May in the adoption of the Regional Transportation Plan. And with that adoption, we have refreshed the Wasatch Choice Vision uh, materials and messages and want to share them with with everybody. So what you're looking at on the screen here is the new uh, wasatchchoice.org website. It just launched about a week ago. And I'm reading right from the website. You can see it there. Utah is growing and we have a plan. Our future quality of life depends on the choices we make today. Wasatch Choice Vision is our community's shared vision for coordinated transportation investments, development patterns, and economic opportunities. The Wasatch Choice Map and Key Strategies show how advancing the vision can enhance quality of life even as we grow. So um, this vision is made up of four key strategies that as we talk about the vision together, um, communities in the region, we can think of these as the four key ingredients that help us 
thrive. Transportation choices provide people with real choices in how they get around driving, transit, biking, walking, so people can easily reach their destinations. Housing, housing options support housing types and locations that meet the needs of all residents. Parks and public spaces ensure ample and convenient parks, public spaces, and open land for gathering and recreating. And city and town centers that uh, walkable areas where activity is focused with places to live, work, and play. And this vision is uh, brought together in a nice little video. I'm going to stop sharing and look to uh, Jordan, who is going to show you this video. And then I'll wrap up with a few minutes of the Wasatch Choice map and hand it back to you, Mr. Chair. OK, Rosie. Utah is growing, and we have a plan. Our future quality of life depends on the choices we make today. The Wasatch Choice Vision is our community's shared vision for transportation investments, development patterns, and economic opportunities. Utah is one of the fastest growing states in the nation, and with rapid growth come challenges and opportunities. The Wasatch Choice Vision was created with broad community input. It represents a shared vision for our future. Its four key strategies can help us find solutions as we address challenges and plan for tomorrow in a way that preserves and even enhances our quality of life. Looking at our streets and trails, it's apparent more people want to walk and bike in our communities. Wasatch Choice includes our shared plan for investment to support biking and walking, as well as roadways and public transportation. As Utah's population continues to grow and change, it's essential to offer a diverse set of housing options across the Wasatch Front and Utah for people with varying preferences, at different life stages, and with different income levels. Our outdoor recreation areas continue to face a record number of visitors year after year not just in the mountains or at our national parks, but also in parks and on trails closer to home. We need more parks and public spaces as we grow. City and town centers are the hearts of our communities. Walkable areas with a mix of homes, jobs, and amenities located by major road and transit connections. These Wasatch Choice Centers give Utahns great options for where to live, work, and play. Where growth occurs matters. While there's no one-size-fits-all approach, as communities grow and work together to implement the Wasatch Choice vision, we'll see many benefits. Stronger communities, improved transportation, enhanced environment, more housing choices, fiscal responsibility, and a strong economy. Utah's economic strength depends on how easily people can access job and educational opportunities. Growth is still coming, and communities along the Wasatch Front have a plan. The Wasatch Choice Vision, to maintain and enhance quality of life in the face of growth. Learn more about the Wasatch Choice Vision and participate in your community's conversation about how to address today's challenges and create a brighter tomorrow. Thank you, Rosie. Now, so if we go back to the Wasatch Choice webpage, that's where you can go to this interactive map. The interactive map has a tab for the vision for transportation details that reflects the regional transportation plan that we have all developed together. It reflects centers and land uses, which are put forward by local governments as they think about the future of transportation and quality of life in the region, economic opportunities, parks and public spaces. I'm just gonna walk through briefly the just the vision tab. Now look at the geography of this. Wasatch Choice is something that a lot of us have gotten uh, familiar with over the previous years. This is a very unusual thing. Um, first of all, it spans from Southern Box Elder, Brigham City, all the way down through the Southern end of Utah County. Uh, that includes as well Tooele County, Morgan, Summit, Wasatch County. This is the greater region. That is a remarkable thing to have that together in a voluntary vision. It's also a long range vision. Now it relies on actions that we 
can and should be working on today, but it looks out into all the way out to 2050 to think about, well, what's the future that we aspire to and that we're working to create? And it's holistic. So it coordinates each entity kind of um, responsible for their own piece, local government actions for land development and economic opportunity, regional infrastructure providers, transportation, transit, bikes, trails, all of those components coming together and how do they align geographically? So we're zooming in here to just unpack this just a tiny bit. Um, you're looking at uh, you know, Southern Weber County, Northern Davis County, and Bert is gonna turn off all the layers and we're just gonna look at them one-on-one -on -one really quickly. So starting with centers. Now, when we talk about centers, we're talking about areas that have focused intensity, they're walkable, they have a mix of uses, but really they're the community's gathering places. So they range in scale um, and they fit what each community is striving for it, when, they, when they're working for their um, central gathering places. It could be a metro center uh, like you see in downtown Ogden, that uh, you know purple color, or it could be an urban center Clearfield, Layton are a couple that you see here on the screen. It could be uh, city centers, Roy, Riverdale, uh, Newgate, or it could be a neighborhood center like you see there in uh, Clinton. It kind of fits the aspirations of each community. It's not just about centers. It's also about important other land uses that include certainly the residential neighborhoods that we are um, trying to protect from having to handle Utah's fast growth to industrial areas, employment districts, special districts, college campuses, these are critically important. And then it also includes open space. What is the future of open space that we aspire to? Now, as Bert goes to the transportation infrastructure, what you're looking at here is a picture as, as if you got in your time machine and you landed in 2050, what would the network be for major roadways or for public transportation in blue. Uh, you just turn them all on, Bert. Uh, and then uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure as well. And importantly, how do these align together? Turn back on the centers and all of the land uses. And this is really the question, how do we align these? I'll just leave it that we forecast the benefits of if we together implement this voluntary regional vision, which is so unusual across the country, we, we calculate that people can get to 30% more destinations within a, a typical commute than if we don't do it, um, that we'd save about 35 square miles of development than if we don't do this, and that uh, you know we, we could reduce our water consumption by 3 billion gallons a year. These are really significant benefits and they attest to the value of us coordinating our planning. Mr. Chair, that's uh, our a little overview of the refre refreshed Wasatch Choice vision. Thank you, Ted, appreciate that. It is a great site. If you haven't been onto it, go in and play with it. It's, uh, I, I do think we should have said, we do have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Not just that we have one, but uh, anyhow, great. Very, very good. And then, uh, I'm going to turn some time over to Wayne real quick, if you'd just kind of give us an update on our safety action plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As we've talked in Transcom before, uh, in collaboration with local governments and UDOT and UTA, uh, WFRC was asked to lead the development of a comprehensive safety action plan for the region. And, uh, were awarded funding through the Safe Streets and Roads for All program uh, to accomplish this, along with a, a local match uh, that the regional council has uh, provided. And just wanted to take this opportunity to remind you, if you haven't seen this invite in your inbox, um, next Tuesday at 10 a.m., there's a virtual kickoff or launch meeting for development of this uh, safety action plan over the next several months, which will make local governments, once it's completed, 
will make local governments eligible to apply for uh, funding through this Safe Streets for All program uh, to actually implement uh, safety improvements. So any questions about that? 10 o'clock next Tuesday, August 22nd, virtual launch meeting. And then one other note, uh, also related to funding, uh, just wanted to remind everyone, Andrea Olson at our last meeting of Transcom talked about this, but uh, the Transportation Investment Fund and the Transit Transportation Investment Fund uh, our re UDOT is receiving nominations or the application period uh, for nominations for those funds uh, is open until August 31st. So just wanted to give that reminder. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. We need a meeting next Tuesday is virtual, so bring your own snacks, but, uh, but be there anywhere or anyway. So do we have anyone here for a public comment? I don't think there was anybody online either. So we will move for forward. We've got uh, a few things to discuss with our uh, transportation improvement program. Um, a couple of, couple of different items. First is a request to modify the existing 2023-2028 uh, tip, which Ben will, uh, will review with us. And the second is the draft 2024-2029 tip. Um, talking about billions of dollars here. So uh, I, I would not be the guy to, to to describe it all for you that would would really you know fall to ben so um when these are done we will need motions on these but we're because trans yeah, because uh, wfrc meets next week we need recommendations for them to approve and uh, not approval from us today so ben it's yours mr chair so with the items, as the chair has indicated, there are a couple items that we will cover today and we'll get into more description of the tip. Normally we do that in the preface, but we'll do that later on in the discussion here. So item 4A is an action board modification for your review and recommendation to the council. And 4B, the action or the recommend, the approval, and we'll get into that with some little enthusiasm and excitement as we move forward here. In your meeting materials, there are four tables that are attached to a resolution. This is a very fairly large board modification. Each of those four tables has at least four new projects. This particular first page has five new projects. We'll review these quickly. We will not go into the detail on these projects with the regional council, they will take the recommendation from Transcom. So hence, we'll have the opportunity to review these together. So the very first project is a project in Tooele. This is a request from UDOT. This is on Highway 112 or SR 112 at 600 West. This particular project is an intersection improvement. This project will inter improve this intersection. You can see the existing condition of that. You have you're shared through right lefts on your north and south legs, and then you have shared rights um, on your east and west, as well as the left turn lane. The objectives of the improvements of this project is to widen all four legs. Tooele City will widen the north and south legs of this project and separate the left turns from the through right turns. And then the east-west legs or Highway 112 they will separate all the movements there with a, a left turning, a through lane, and a right turning lane for that particular project. This is a new project of the program. It's being funded through the Transportation Solution Programs of Region 2. Estimated funding for this project is $1.5 million, with the total being $1.5 million. The next project that we have is located in Salt Lake County. This is a request from UDOT. This is on Neff's Canyon. This is a trailhead improvement, a little different from a normal project with UDOT, but because of the funding and the application, this is a project located in Mill Creek Canyon. This is to resurface the trailhead parking lot and install new restrooms in this facility. You can see a couple of pictures of the existing 
I didn't have any pictures of the what you don't have before you have a restroom construction. But this particular project um, has some um, the Federal Consolidation Appropriation Act funds of 2023. And in Mill Creek City, we'll have a local match on that project. So we have 800,000 coming from the, the FCAA and then the 58,000 plus from Mill Creek for a total project cost of 858,000 plus. The next project is also in Salt Lake City. This is a project down in Bluffdale. Uh, Bluffdale was successful in a request for some discretionary funds for a pedestrian overpass. In the particular area, this is the study area or the location for the need of the overpass. You can see some of the obstacles that they have to cross over with the East Jordan Canal, the Utah Salt Lake Central or Canal, the Jordan River, you got the Union Pacific and the UTA railroads. And if you look clear to the top there, that's the existing undercrossing there for that whole facility. Down near the very bottom there, you can see a new school. Um, right here is an existing at grade private crossing of the railroad right there at Cinch Way. You can see the, the middle school there. The intention here of this project is to construct these are two of the areas, the alternatives that they're looking at for the improvements, but it's to design and construct the pedestrian bicycle bridge over the railroad, the canal, and the Jordan River. Um, the new funds come from a $3.2 plus million dollar of railroad crossing elimination, and then the local match of 646,000 plus from Bluffdale City. The next project that we have is a project in Tooele. This particular project is on the Mid Valley Highway. Now this is a looking at the map through Google and if we were to align what the study area is for the Mid Valley Highway, to line that right up, give you an idea where the Mid Valley Highway study area is. Here it is looking at it. You can see the alignments that are being evaluated. The purpose of this board modification takes place down here at the Twilla Army Depot area. This request is for right-of-way purchase. Uh, they're anticipating that this purchase of this right-of-way could take as much as three years. So they're requesting this as a separate project for right-of-way in this area for 500,000. The next project here is in uh, Ivapa Road, this is a little far out there in Tooele County, um, almost over by Windover area. This particular area is for roadway and safety improvements. The, the intent of this or looking at this project is not only the roadway surface project, but it's also to install guardrails, update the traffic signs and upgrade the drainage in the culvert area. Now this has funding from several locations. It's a total funding amount of 18 plus million dollars. Um, in this, we got 3.5 million from the Federal Consolidated Appropriations Act. We have 254,000 plus from Tooele County. We have six plus million from the Rural Surface Transportation Grant Program and 8.3 plus million from the nationally significant um, federal lands and tribal project. So uh, a combined effort to accomplish a great deal of work on this little road way out to the west. That brings us to our next table. This has four board modifications included in it. The first board modification is a project up in Weber County. This is a UDOT project on US 89. This project is for pavement rehabilitation between Wall Avenue and 2700 North. Uh, the pavements begin to deteriorate quicker than anticipated because of the severe winter we had and the additional amount, well, anticipated uh, increasingly high traffic volumes on this particular facility. A couple of pictures on there. Not only is the roadway deteriorating, but there's rain that's involved. So this project will remove and replace a rotomill and overlay a 1.5 inch of pavement 
it'll uh, restore the pavement surface. Estimated project cost is $5.5 million. And this, these funds come through the high volume program that uh, the department has set aside. The next project is in Davis County. This on US 89. This is between SR 193 and Weber River. This project is a project that's outside of the 89 project that just completed or is finishing up with some little minor touches here. But on this particular road, this also has seen an increase of volume of traffic and the pavement is also accelerating in deterioration. So the idea is to come in and do a pavement rehabilitation in this particular area. It's a new project estimated to cost 5.4 plus million dollars. It'll also road a mill and overlay with a 1.5 inch pavement and reduce the rutting and restore the pavement surface. Our next project is back up in Weber. This is a UDOT project. This is on Wall Avenue or SR 204. And this is between 23rd Street and US 89. Now this project was previously on the tip and it was funded, but as they began the design work for this project with the anticipation to be go into construction in 2024, the engineer's estimate is a bit higher. And so the region is requesting an additional amount of funds so that this project when ready can go out for ad, um, advertising. So they're requesting $3.6 million, giving us a total project volume or amount of $5.1 plus million. The next project is in Davis County. This is on 2000 West or SR 108. This is to reconstruct and widen SR 108 or 2000 West between 300 North and 1800 North. This takes an existing three lane section can see looking on the far side there where we're still a three lane section with some shoulder and it is to expand that facility to a five lane section with the shoulder. Um, they've advertised this project. The project went out and uh, came back at 116% above engineer's estimate. They did not think it would be if they were to re-advertise it that they would be able to get better bids. So they're requesting the additional funds on this project. The additional funds are $8 million for a total project cost of $86 million plus. That brings us to our next table. And in that next table, it uh, begins to introduce a couple of new projects. One, this is a project request from UTA. This is for uh, rail vehicle replacements. This is to purchase 20 new light rail vehicles. Now, maybe a key point here in December of, um, now I'm gonna draw a blank because I'm nervous. I looked up here, but December 4th, uh, 1999 is when the light rail first started. And uh, it's been very successful throughout the area. Um, UTA had set aside $60 million to go in and rehab these vehicles, but then was successful um, in May of this year of 2023, they received funding to buy 20 new light rail vehicles to replace the older vehicles. Now, in this particular grant, it was required that they have a 50-50 match. So the 60 million that UTA had set aside for rehab will go to the match for the 60 million that was awarded and they will be able to purchase new light rail vehicles, 20 of them. Now that leaves 20 more that yet need to be um, replaced or rehabilitated and UTA will work on that in the future, but you'll see that coming up again, but that's for an additional 20 vehicles. So this one here is um, the FTA replacement program there of 60 million and the UTA's 60 million for $120 million. The next one is interesting because it involves several, several of the bus routes for UTA. Uh, this one is, uh, they were successful in June of this year and they were selected to receive a low no grant funding to buy 25 low emission compressed natural gas buses to replace the older diesel buses. Now they 
they don't look too bad, right? But those are the diesel buses. We're all about new and improved air quality and the improvements there. This is the natural gas bus. So they will buy 25 low emission compressed natural gas buses. It'll replace those older diesel buses. But the reason I showed you all the routes of UTA is because these buses that they will purchase will serve the disadvantaged communities. It'll also install a new CNG or compressed natural gas pump there at the depot district facility. So they got 17 plus million in the FTA low, no emissions. And then UTA has the $3 million for the local match. The next project here is a bridge replacement project. This is in Salt Lake County. This is to replace a locally owned bridge in Holiday City. This particular bridge structure is on a federal aid eligible facility. So the bridge funding program will replace or will contribute funds for this project at 6.6 .6 plus million dollars, but because it's on a federal aid eligible facility, it will require a local match of 480,000 plus. And Holiday City is good with that for a total project cost of 7.1 plus million. The next project is also a structure. This is a structure in Midvale City. This is also locally owned and also on a federal aid eligible facility. This particular facility here will be covered with the bridge formula program. Of 2.7 plus million dollars with the local match from Midvale at 203,000 for a total project cost of $3 million. That brings us to our fourth table. The fourth table also introduces more structures. So the first structure we'll look at is a Salt Lake replaced locally owned bridge in Riverton City. This particular facility is on 134 South over the Utah and Salt Lake Canal. This is also on a federal aid eligible facility. So Riverton City will also pay a local match for the improvements on this project. 2.2 plus million of the bridge formula funds and 162,000 plus of the local match for a total project of $2.4 million. The next project is in Salt Lake County. This is to replace a locally owned bridge in Salt Lake City. This particular facility is on Fifth South over the Jordan River. This is not on the federal aid eligible system. So the bridge formula program will cover the full cost of the project improvements at $7.4 million for a total project estimated cost of 7.4 million. Now I might add here on all of the structures that we've talked about, a lot of these are, they go in and do their engineer's best estimate, do the design and with all their experience, they put a sum in there. But the likelihood is, is that a lot of these projects, they'll be sweeping funds back, which will roll towards additional or other bridge um, formula program eligible projects. Um, well, we'll keep going. I'll explain one more. So the next one is a replacement here of a locally bridge um, up in Huntsville. Guess now it'd be a good time. A couple of these bridges I'm showing you are a little outside of Wasatch Front's responsibility. But I wanted to highlight along these, we do report on that on those projects that are in Morgan, as well as Tooele and up in Box Elder County. But highlighting these is showing you the efforts that UDOT is going to to help local governments with the bridges within their jurisdictions, even when they are not on the federal aid or fe federal aid eligible facilities. So this particular project just what, outside of Huntsville. Ben, what qualifies them on the federal aid versus not? What's that? What qualifies them on the federal aid versus not? Thank you. So federal aid eligible roads are roads that are classified as a minor collector, major collector, or arterial or highways. Anything outside of that is considered a non-federal aid eligible. Wayne? Thank you. That's a good explanation, Ben. I'll just add that 
if a local jurisdiction feels like they have a road that's functioning as a minor or major collector or arterial, uh, they're welcome to uh, send a request into, and it usually goes through Wasatch Front then to the state, uh, to UDOT, um, to request that it be added to that federal aid eligible system, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Wayne. So this particular facility, so here's, here's a diagram to maybe give you a, a little clearer idea of where that particular project is located. And, and Google don't even have a street view of this project, but we were by aerial able to zoom in and look at it a little closer there, but you can see um, this particular facility, all of these bridges that we've showed you are below poor, are below fair to poor in their ratings as the state goes through and rates all the bridges. That's where they become or come up with their prioritization. So this particular project is $1.9 million to be funded with the bridge formula program. The last project is actually up in Box Elder County and this is all over. So we're gonna show all four of these fairly quickly, but it's interesting there to look along some of the area. This is the area where the bridges will be located outside of the MBO area, but still within Box Elder County and still highlights or illustrates the efforts of the department to program on the bridge. The first project is near Portage on 258 uh, North Center Street. This is up by the Bear River. See that particular project. The next project is located near Garland at 5600 West and 176 North. Of that particular one. The third project is located near Fielding on the West Canal Bridge. And the fourth project there is located also near Fielding, and this is on the Corinne Canal Bridge. So all of these four projects up in Box Elder County to work on all four of them, that's estimated to $8.9 million and the bridge formula fund will cover the cost on all four of those bridges. That would conclude all of the projects for this board modification. Thank you very much, Ben. Any questions for Ben before we, uh, we take a motion? Okay, then we, yes, sir. I don't remember ever uh, seeing this, and maybe it's just my lack of experience, which is vast lack of experience. Uh, seeing this organization uh, distribute funds to the UTA, Utah Transit Authority. Is, has that been done in the past? Okay, thank you. That was my question. Okay. Then I would entertain I'll a motion. Make a motion, if Mr. Chair, if you're ready to receive it. Yes. Can I? I'm sorry. May I just add one brief supplement? We do. We have historically done so through our funding programs, but I think it's important to note that all projects, whether they're from city, county, UTA, or UDOT, all are evaluated competitively, and they all have to stand on their merits. Okay. Can I make one also comment? Thank you for that question, Commissioner. Um, I also wanted to point out, Ben, that the, the, repla the vehicle replacement is because those vehicles are not ADA compliant and the rehabilitation costs would be such that it would not be viable. So it's better to buy new, mostly for the blue line. So just, to, just a point of Thank clarification. You. And, um, and we also have received um, competitive grants in the CMAC funding range as well. So we get all different types. So just wanted to clarify. Okay, thank you. So we need a motion to recommend approval of uh, these modifications to the council. I'll se <laughs> second. <laughs> we have a motion from Mayor Tran and, and now a second from Commissioner Harvey. You got that stolen right out from underneath you, Jim. That's, that's all right. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, that is unanimous. And uh, we'll turn the time back over to Ben for the 2429. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in a lot of our areas, uh, school started today, summer's coming to an end. So maybe, you know, if you got some marshmallows and some chocolate, we've got some more stuff that we're going to talk about here. This is the exciting stuff. This right here is your recommendation to the Regional Council for approval of the 2024-2029 Transportation Improvement Program. As earlier noted by the chair, there's tens billion plus dollars. Well, I guess we can't say 10 billion plus, but there's $10 billion worth of projects in this document along the Wasatch Front and in areas that are associated in the state. That's not statewide. That's within the Wasatch Front area. Significant amount of money here. So the TIP, the Transportation 2024-2029 Transportation Improvement Program. So what is the TIP? And this is where we'll go through a little more and closer. It's a six-year program of highway transit and active transportation projects. The first four years are what we consider funded years. Those are years where projects can move around, the funding can move up and back as they prepare through their design, as they prepare for right away and then into construction. The out two years, we refer to that as concept development years. Um, and that's when we're programming new projects, which we'll initiate here soon. That's the years that we're putting the new projects in is that concept development year. It's in the urban areas for the Salt Lake West Valley and the Ogden Lake urban areas. So essentially from Brigham City all the way down to Utah County. It's funded with federal, state, and local programs, and it's for all the cities to the counties, Utah and UTA. It implements the long range plans for highway transit and active transportation projects. It helps us meet the short range needs of the Wasatch Front, and it provides for the maintenance of our existing transportation system. Now, I know I show you this information every time almost, but it's important that we recognize the significant role you play in our transportation system along the Wasatch Front. And we're grateful for all that you do and your willingness to participate. So in the Transportation Improvement Program, it lists the projects for new construction, rehab and maintenance, safety and intelligent transportation systems, that's ITS, Transit and operation and maintenance is O&M and pedestrian and bike type projects. So you'll recall here that when we, this body here approved projects um, in the STP program, there was a couple of projects that we highlighted. One of them was up in far west, just to construct a, a roundabout there, improve sidewalk and safety features for not only the traffic, motoring traffic, but the neighborhoods and the schools. We've got another project that was recommended in the Salt Lake area on the West Valley Magna on 7200 West. We currently had some funding programmed and this body recommended an additional 2.4 million for this particular project. When we were evaluating and looking at the CMAC projects, here are some of the CMAC projects that were recommended from Transcom to the Regional Council. All of this information went out for public review and comment. Here's a project from the TAP. We had a project here in Centerville City. We had another project that was identified up in Harriman City. And then we had the CRP program, brand new program, the carbon reduction program here. We identified, or it was recommended from this, this body here for an intersection improvement in West Point and another project in Holiday for signal optimization enhancements. These were able to give us with the tool that we developed here with Kevin, we were able to verify that we were getting good carbon reduction benefits from this project. And we'll be working with the state in the future as we develop a carbon reduction program and to accomplish the goals for the state. But we also have the capacity projects, construction. Wouldn't it be cool to drive this? We could have this out there and we could all take turns. Um, I, We've got all of these different capacity projects that are identified. There's a picture here of the West Davis. We've got our rehab and maintenance type projects. We got our safety and intelligent transportation system projects. 
We've got our transit operation and maintenance projects. And then we've got the pedestrian and bike facilities projects. All of these projects are part of the transportation improvement program. They all went out for public review and comment, represents millions of dollars, thousands of jobs. The economic growth and development as Ted was referring to earlier there, we have mobility and access, preservation of life and promote the quality of life that we're all accustomed to. So federal law requires that we're financially constrained that we conform to air quality, that it be reviewed by the public and then approved by the regional council. This body will take this information, make this recommendation to the regional council for their approval. So when we went out for public review and comment, we took a copy of all of the projects, a table of all the projects, as well as the air quality memorandum. We provided all of this information online and then, well, there's an interactive map. I thought I switched around. We'll get to the interactive map in just a second. So all that information was provided to them. We met with this body and on the 15th of June, you recommended and gave us approval to go out for public review and comment starting on the 24th of June, of June and concluding on the 29th of July. During that time, we had two public open houses, one on the 11th in the Salt Lake Intermodal and one on the 13th in the Ogden Lane Intermodal. We then took this information to the technical advisory committees on the 3rd of August and reviewed all this information with them. Here we are today with this body reviewing the information and with hopes your approval to the regional council, the regional council taking that recommendation well then approve and the information goes to federal highways and federal transit for their review and approval. And then hopefully that first Monday in October, we have the brand new transportation improvement program, the 2024-9 TIP. Then the next round starts all over and we begin this process real quick. Now here's something that's real cool I wanted to point out. You know, coincidence, we started on the 24th. We concluded on the 29th. It's the 2429 tip. Isn't that cool? I thought that was pretty cool. All right, anyway, here we go. So we turned everybody to go to our webpage, www.wfrc. I get that right. Anyway, our webpage. On that webpage, we had an interactive map. Now, the interactive map has been an, a tool that has been a great resource for us. It gives everybody that opportunity to review that information to go in, zoom in on a project in the privacy of their own home, hopefully with their family gathered around, they all enjoy it, eating popcorn, ice cream, and whatever else they want to as I identify projects and list comments. Well, there were a few comments that were received this year. In your meeting materials, here's a summary. Wayne does this tremendous job of summarizing up with the help of the staff there on the, the, the comments. We had over 300 comments received. And then also in your meeting materials are all of the individual comments that are received. So statistic wise, we had 189 comments that were project specific on the interactive map. We had 108 comments on the interactive map as a general comment. We had nine specific comments from the open houses. And then we had one from an email we had approximately 4,200 plus views over social, social media content, promoting the tip in the public comment period, and 217 engagements with those posts, like likes, shares, likes, clicks, the, the, all that other stuff that goes with social media. Anyway, all of that was reviewed and received. Now, so what happens with our public comment? Do we just gather it and throw it away? No, actually, when we gather it, we document it. And then we present that to the various committees, the project meetings, and then those uh, appropriate improvements are implemented into the project. Now, this is something that a lot of times you tell that to folks and they go, yeah, sure you do. And then, but there are specific projects. Almost every project that we work with 
has some modification due to public comment. I've highlighted a few documents with UDOT that I'd like to point out. The, the one project, PIN 17627, if you want to get technical on it, it's a, a project to add northbound lane, install a portable CFI to the south leg of, oh, sorry, I should tell you what project. This is on Redwood Road, and this is the improvement from 6200 south to I-215, a significant road owned by UDOT. Everybody knows that it's busy, but through the public comment period, um, well, I'll tell you all that the project includes first, it'll add a northbound lane, it'll install a partial CFI to the south leg of 6200 South, and for northbound traffic, it'll add dual on-ramps and ramp metering on the eastbound and westbound I-215. So a significant project, right? Due to comments and inputs from the public and the businesses during the design, there was modifications done to the signals and the signal improvements, where the raised medians should start and stop, as well as other roadway improvements. About a $17 million project that was impacted with public review and comment. Another project was in Foothill Boulevard. This is a pedestrian project with landscape improvements due to the public comment and inputs that modified the landscape areas, including the type of landscape that would be used with utilizing trees and some of the larger vegetation to help calm traffic. Um, also the crossing, the location and the type of crossing, it's a unique angle crossing, which allows for a shorter cross time for bikes and pads and reduces that stop time for the traffic. Another project, whoops, that ended that. Another project was on Bangor. These interchanges as the public input's always been important with the the transformation from an intersection to an interchange. But in this particular last round of the Southern interchanges, um, 4,700 South, 9,800 South, and 13400 South interchanges, because of the public comment, all three of those interchanges are now underpass instead of overpass type. They all go under Bangor Highway. Uh, that resulted in a substantial amount of funding, but that was what was voiced with through the public comment. That total project is about a $273 million project. There were other on I-80 and that, but I don't want to belittle. There is an important role that the public plays in this process, and we want that to be known um, and that they're utilized by all. But Mr. Chair, that is all that is prepared for this. Mr. Chair, may I, I just wanted to yes. quickly you bet, um, put in a, um, an add on to what Ben just said about the public engagement. Uh, what Ben's noting is we use it at WFRC, but then it's also really important, and you already said this, I'm just emphasizing that the information is shared with our partners. So we have, for example, um, Kevin Van Tassel is with us as a member of the Utah Transportation Commission. And I know that and Ben is noting uh, UDOT, the team, and the and the commission, they get this information also. This feeds into them in, in terms of decisions they make. We've got two of the UTA trustees here, and we work with the with the UTA and the staff, and then also the cities and counties uh, that Ben and the team work with really closely. So the public engagement, not only we don't just do it because we have to, um, we do it because it makes the projects better. Um, and then also it's just appropriate role of government to engage and have dialogue with the public. So thank you, Ben. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Ben. We, we need a public oh, for Ben for 24, 2029. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen at 2025, 2030, um, but we'll look forward to that next year. That's um, how we right? set the dates for our uh, meetings, apparently. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware of that, but apparently that's that how Ben is, is setting so well. dates now. Yeah. This is good. I was just going to share that um, tomorrow evening, I, I'm planning to show a movie in my backyard to friends and family on one of those big blow up screens. And we were going to watch the movie Flash, but Ben has convinced me to do the interactive map instead. Awesome. And I'd be a lot more popular in my neighborhood for having done so. So thanks, Ben. And he didn't want to say this a lot loud, but he's inviting all of us. <laughs> <laughs> we also might need an approval of the use of the month of Jalum. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Ben. 
Oh, that's great. <laughs> so, Carl, so that was a sort of a motion by Carlton and a second by Beth to, to provide public notice of the viewing in Carlton's backyard. Yeah, sure. That's the way I did. That. That's what I heard. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Mike, <laughs> Jordan, you guys got that. Okay, we'll put that online. All right. And then moving forward, we do need a motion to approve the 2020 or to recommend approval, excuse me, of the 2024 2029 transportation improvement program, including the air quality conformity findings. Mr. Chair, I so move. And we have a second from Ann Granado. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that is unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you, Ben. Um, item number five is our WFRC funding opportunities for local governments. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Wayne to give us that information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Apologies to those who have heard this already today, but uh, as you're aware, WFRC administers or assists with uh, various, several funding programs. Uh, and since the application cycle is just about to begin again, uh, we thought we'd take the opportunity to briefly overview uh, these programs that WFRC has the opportunity to administer. So there are three types of programs, transportation capital improvements, planning assistance, and other federal grants. And I'll talk about uh, that first category and then turn it over to Meg Townsend uh, to talk about the other two categories. And... Thank you. So the surface transportation program, uh, is, those funds can be used for all kinds of uh, roadway improvements, transit improvements, and active transportation improvements. The congestion mitigation air quality and carbon reduction programs are obviously, as you're well aware, focused on making air quality improvements uh, or for projects that uh, reduce emissions. And then the transportation alternatives program is focused on planning and uh, construction of uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities. So with that, I'll turn it over to Meg. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks for having us. Um, Wayne talked about these capital transportation improvement programs. I am going to talk about the other two types of programs we have, planning assistance programs and other federal grants. Um, first, the planning assistance programs. So this includes our transportation and land use connection program, which many of you are familiar with. That's planning technical assistance, really just any planning work in your city that implements the Los Edge Choice vision, um, connects land use and transportation as the name suggests is eligible under that program. That's a partnership with UDOT, UTA, and Salt Lake County as well. And it follows that same funding cycle as the other um, STP programs. The second is the Station Area Plan Technical Assistance Program. This is intended to help your cities accomplish what you need to under House Bill 462 from 2022, which required your cities to do station area planning if you've got a station within a half mile or within your city. So give us a, a call if you, if you have one of those or you think that that applies to you. This funding is rolling. It's available on a rolling basis. You can apply anytime. We'll award it pretty quickly thereafter and we'll get moving because we want to help you meet those deadlines that are um, imposed. I am the lead for both of these programs. Give me a call if you have questions about any of those. The other type of um, assistance we have here uh, kind of a catch-all here for our Community Development Block Grant Program. CDBG is a federal grant program that provides funding for low to moderate income communities and funds primarily capital infrastructure projects. This application cycle starts in the fall with that how to apply workshop that is mandatory to attend. Um, and this program applies to a subset of the communities within our AOG that is Morgan, Tooele, and Weber counties. Other communities have entitlement to CDBG programs. So we run, we run that for those communities. CIB is a grant slash loan program that can be applied for at any point of the year. CIB can fund planning and capital infrastructure projects. 
in Morgan and Tooele counties, again, a subset of our region. Christy Dahlberg is the program lead for that program and CDBG. Finally, the Wasatch Front Economic Development District, one of our committees here at WFRC and a um, federally recognized economic development district. The WFEDD fosters regional economic developments and assists eligible entities in developing competitive grant applications to the EDA. So we help you apply for federal money through EDA um, and that's what the EDD is here to do. So reach out anytime if you're interested in federal programs you hear about um, for economic development. Marsha White in our office is the lead for that one. So the programs that Wayne talked about along with the transportation and land use connection program for planning assistance are all on the same deadline and they share a letter of intent um, starting in September, or we're gonna make that call for letters of intent in August. Um, after our council meeting next week, you'll get a funding packet for those. Um, and then in September, the letters of intent are due. That's the same letter of intent for all of those programs. So fill it out. Um, if, you, if you mislabel which program you're intending to apply to, that's okay. We, we sort those out and get, and get you to the right program before you actually com complete an application and put that work in. If you're eligible, you'll be notified soon after you submit your letter of intent. And then the applications or concept reports are due in December. Um, we'll review those on slightly different timelines. TLC awards are made in March. Short range programs, um, you know, as you, uh, as Transcom certainly knows, has a little bit more of a process. Again, whichever program you put that letter of intent in for, it's just fine. Just get those letters of intent in by um, September 28th. Here's the contact information for all of those folks that we mentioned today. Again, reach out. If you get one of us, you get all of us. Call anytime and keep your eye out for that funding program packet. It'll be out soon. Happy to, happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Megan. Appreciate that. Make sure you take that back to your councils and staff so that they're aware of it. Andrew? Once again, um, thanks, Wayne and Meg. Just a, a point of um, emphasis. There's sort of no wrong door for looking for assistance from WFRC. I, I often think that when if I put myself in your shoes as local elected officials and you're constantly, many of you are part-time and you're constantly getting information about various programs and opportunities. If you have a need in your community and you're not sure, can you help? What's the right program? Where do we go? You can talk to us. You can submit a simple letter of intent and if, it's, if we're not the right entity and it's UTA or it's UDOT or it's the feds or whoever, we will do everything we can to help you um, chart that course. Um, so, you know, our, our, our starting point is we want to help you. We may not be able to give you money, okay, but we want to help you. And so please, you know, as I'm echoing what Meg said, come to any of us um, and we'll do what we can to, to help you out. Thank you, Andrew. All right, last item on our agenda is uh, item number six. We're gonna turn the time back over to Wayne, to talk about our self-certification of our transportation planning review. Thank you, Mayor. So each year in connection with the approval of the TIP and the statewide transportation improvement program, we have the opportunity to self-certify to the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration that we're uh, complying with all the federal regulations. In other words, that the joint process among UTA, UDOT, and WFRC is compliant with all the federal regulations. So in your meeting materials, there's a 20-ish page document outlining how we're complying with all the uh, requirements of the planning process. Uh, there's discussion on planning structure. There's discussion on the data and other technical elements. There's discussion on the primary products of the planning process. And so invite you to peruse that if you have not already, uh, but that outlines how we're complying with the federal requirements. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Wayne. That is everything I had on the agenda. Andrew, did you wanna uh, 
And we don't have executive director's report or anything on here. Is there anything you wanted to cover with us? I don't think so, but that's not an action item. Is that an action item? It is. Oh, it, it is, is an action item. item. Sorry, excuse I me. Not... It is an action item. I apologize for that. Uh, we need to recommend uh, approval of this to the regional council. Motion to send this to the regional council, Mr. Chair, for approval, that is. Thank you. Second. Mike, we're we second. Have, there you go. We have a whole bunch of seconds. Um, take, take your pick. <laughs> Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. That is it. I don't have anything affirmatively, but if anybody wants to talk about anything or ask any of us any questions, we're always open. And they're here. Or people just want to leave. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't leave until I share that um, UTA is opening up OGX. Our newest BRT line starts next, the tw this, this Sunday. Yes. I was going to say next Monday, but apologies. Um, and I just want to let everyone know that we're really excited and we could not have done it without everybody here looking at uh, how we can increase our connectivity. So I am mentioning this because I love Commissioner Harvey and I wanted to celebrate his neck of the woods. So, yeah. So anyway, great opportunity. We're very excited. And they're having a huge public event on the 26th, which is a Saturday, um, I think from nine to noon and just opening up uh, the city as a whole, they're just going to do a lot of, we're going to do a lot of fun, quirky things. Uh, Willy Wonka is a theme. Celebrate. Come and ride it for free for the next three years. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Right. Nice Carlson, job. did you have something? No, it was along that same line. On, on the 26th, there's a, it's free fare through the whole system. So you can get on, go up and, and check it out in Ogden if you'd like, if you're not in Ogden. And then, of course, the next couple days uh, today and tomorrow DEQ has made um, ridership free. Very good. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I realize I do have one uh, one quick no, thing. I'm sorry, we've already passed that. No, I'm just card <laughs> <laughs> um, This is about the membership here. So uh, Dr. Kevin Cromar, Kevin, he says, call me Kevin, don't call me doctor, fine. Um, Kevin has been a member of Transcom for, for several years now as the appointee from the Air Quality Board. So Air Quality Board has a member they appoint one of their members to serve on Transcom and also one of their members to serve on the Regional Growth Committee. Um, and this is Kevin's last meeting uh, with Aww. Transcom. <laughs> <laughs> but you will be happy to know that he's he's not departing from WFRC. He's actually switching over to Regional Growth Committee. Um, so he is now going to be the appointee, well, is, and came this morning. So Kevin spent like the whole day with us. Thank you. Um, switching over to the Regional Growth Committee um, Mayor Silvestrini, Jeff Silvestrini, is now a member of the Air Quality Board, and he is going to be a member of Transcom. So he'll be swapping out for Kevin. And I also want to say that we have really, um, speaking for, certainly for our staff, and I imagine the whole body, we've really appreciated Kevin's um, active engagement in this uh, group. And we've had these conversations. Sometimes Kevin makes us a little anxious, okay, because he pushes he asks a lot of questions. He asks a lot of why questions. Why are we doing this? Is there a better approach to take on that? But always with the intention of achieving the, max, the maximum possible benefit with the dollars we're allocating and maximum benefit for air quality and for the community. So I just want to express appreciation to you, Kevin. Thank you. Amen. We'll second that. All right. Anything else? Entertain a motion to adjourn. We have a second. Okay. Stand adjourned.